when going through a tough time, we tend to rush through the process because it's so much better on the other side. But life will continue to give us the test until we learn the tools we need to get through the rough patches. What if I told you that experiencing the full range of emotions are the building blocks we need to ace that test? On today's episode, my guest is Luke Lehman, and he is going to help us navigate the murky waters of slowing down our healing process and truly finding that place of gratitude and mental resilience. The answer is powerful. It involves a new way to view the warrior mindset, and I think it's going to surprise you. Luke is an entrepreneur, mentor, and host of the Shift Work podcast. He's an exhilarating guest with a diverse background from being a fighter pilot to business owner and entrepreneur. Now, I've known Luke personally for about a year now. He's one of those guys who practice what he preaches and preaches what he practices. With decades of experience leading high performance and high growth organizations, Luke has cracked the code on how to live with an intentional alignment enjoying all that life has to offer while sustainably growing businesses across the globe. He has led multiple seven and eight figure businesses, as well as leading the highest performing organization in the United States Air Force. Amongst his many accolades, he's a recipient of a Combat Action Medal and Single Mission Air Medal for combat operations flown in the A-10 Warthog. Additionally, Luke is a recipient of multiple business awards, including being voted top 40 under 40 in 2019. Luke's entrepreneurial accelerator framework is the method which he applies in his own business as well as those he invests in. The pillars for success are coaching high performance mindset by becoming the commander, accelerating revenue and profit in his jet fuel sales and marketing strategy and creating leverage growth systems in the autopilot method. Let's welcome to the Gratitude Builds Fortitude podcast, Luke Lehman. Luke Lehman, welcome to the Gratitude Builds Fortitude podcast. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Holly. Certainly excited to be here with you. Yeah, and I know I just read your official bio, but I'm excited to ask you a bunch of questions. You have a recent book out called Building Resilience, which if you're watching the video of this, I've got lots of tabs and lots of dog ears. So I'm excited to get into this. I'm excited to get into your story. But the very first question I have before I even talk about the book or the story or resilience or anything like that is um, for those of us who, even though I was married to an army guy, I don't know anything about planes other than flying in one to get from point A to point B and Tom Cruise in Top Gun. So that's all I know about planes. So can you explain when you talk about like being a fighter pilot and some of these planes and what all of you guys flew and what that kind of means and looks like? Yeah, absolutely. Well, you've got a good foundation, you know, and I think the funny thing is generationally. So I took my son to see Top Gun 2. And it you know it was a fun little blast from the past, I guess, to relive. You know, I'm trying to think back when I would have seen Top Gun the first time. And <laughs> the other funny thing is, I, I let him watch the first Top Gun, my son seven, and I'm like, oh, that was regrettable because what was PG-13 in 1980, whatever it is, is no longer PG-13 anymore. Right. So he learned a couple of uh, uh, a couple of words that he shouldn't have, <laughs> but. Um, you know, so the the book Building Resilience was co-authored with a few good friends of mine, all fighter pilots, mostly Air Force, one Navy um, F-18 pilot as well. And all all of them, except for me, actually flew what we would just consider to be pointy nose airplanes. So fighter aircraft that are fast, that are designed to do aerial intercept missions, air to air combat type stuff. I flew a much different airplane. I flew an airplane called the A-10 Warthog, which was an air to ground airplane. And the, you know, I tell the story, I, I, I think that the airplane chose me more than I chose the airplane. And I, it, when I was going through pilot training at 22 years old, frankly, 
um, it was not the first on, on my dream sheet of what I wanted to fly. But one of the reasons why I ended up flying it was because I actually did very well in the low level phase of pilot training. I was very comfortable at low altitudes and this airplane was designed in increased threat to be flown at low altitudes. And generally we would fly that thing around hundred feet above the ground, which uh, we can talk about all day long. But once you get below 500 feet, the radar altimeter really stops working in the airplane and you begin to measure your altitude based on what's happening on the ground. So if you know that there's 50 foot pine trees or hundred feet pine trees is that you just double it. And so that it was really interesting to kind of think about how that airplane uh, chose me. It's one of the, uh, another just phenomenal book. There's a uh, female fighter pilot named Kim Campbell goes by KC. It costs on actually a killer chick. And her, um, her story is she actually got shot, um, shot up pretty bad in Iraq and it ended up uh, just bringing the airplane home. It's a phenomenal story, but they wrote the first book together as well with KC. So when we got this group of people together, each of the, each of the authors had something around resilience and a story that needed to be shared. And the idea was to basically draw upon our experiences in the military and to recount the uh, you know, the aftermath or the, the coming back together that has made us to be more resilient people. And then how we can relay that to others in a manner. And, and we talked about it in the pre-show that you can read on, on an airplane ride, you know, single airplane ride that you can consume it. Yeah. And I actually did read um, almost the whole book on my airplane ride um, to, to Phoenix. And it's great because you actually have in on your shift work podcast episodes, I think 66 to 68 are your take on building resilience. And then you actually interview your co-authors in some additional episodes. So I think it's great that not only do you have this book for consumption to read, and it's, it is a very quick and easy and entertaining and very motivational read, but then you also have the podcast as well with all your other great episodes, but to be able to pull a lot of this book in there. So yeah, this is great. Luke, what is your definition of resilience? Resilience. I think of resilience as the elasticity, the, the spring back component and when I think about our waves of life, the cycles that we go through, so we're going to, we're certainly going to experience adversity or trauma or tragedy. And there's going to be those periods of time and there's no prescription for how low the, the depth or how wide the length that that thing needs to occur. And we see folks get into depression and anxiety, but being able to build a more resilient life is the ability for that elasticity for you to spring back into what you would consider your level of normalcy, or as we're talking about here on this podcast, your gratitude and your way that you live your life in your highest sense of self and highest sense of being. You know, that's interesting that you talk about elasticity. And one thing that I found in my community is that one of the most common phrases that I hear over and over again is I'm staying strong and I'm staying strong. And it's more like just putting on this facade of just powering through it and thinking that that's resilience or that's fortitude. And really, I think it's a, it's a place of building like you said, that elasticity in your brain to build for not just the time that you're going through, but for future events as well. So that when, when, and I've never heard of it talked about, like you said, from the, from the depth and the breadth. And I love how you, you shared that. And I think it's from a place of the next time around, because there's always going to be a next time that maybe that depth isn't so low and that breath isn't so long. Is that, is that accurate? That's absolutely correct. And I want to, you know, I want to say something to, to a listener who may be going through a tough time is we have a tendency, not only just as humans, 
in our self capacity, but also in the encouragement of others to try to rush through the process to say, let's help you get better. Let's help you heal. Let's help you return. And, and that's not at all what I would even begin to advocate for. Conversely is that when you're going through the tough time is to a bit, to be able to experience that full range of emotions. And, you know, one of the, one of the things that really came up through this book is a lot of things that were unhealed for us. And, you know, everybody's post 40 years old, 40, 50, you know, almost 60 years old who wrote this book. And when we look back at the events, whether they were traumatic or, or, you know, negative to some capacity is that in the military that we're taught to rapidly move through them, to return back to duty, to go fly again. One of the, one of the biggest things that we do in the aviation community is we want to get people back in the cockpit. So when there's a mishap, we actually want you to go fly again. We don't want you to be fearful of the airplane. We want you to go start again. In life though, you know, when the, when you experience those depths is having the ability to go there and to be curious about the emotions, not just mad, glad, sad, and afraid, but to say, what else is it that I'm feeling and what else is uh, that I need to learn? I think you've heard this before that uh, the, the adage goes something like this. It says, uh, school gives you uh, tests so that you can prove that you learned the lesson. Life gives you tests so that you can learn the lesson. How, however it goes, you can Google the quote, but right, the point right. is that life's going to continue to give you the test right. until you learn the lesson. And the next time that this happens, that you'll be more prepared and more resilient, you'll have the tools so that when the tragedy hits, that you'll be able to come back out of, but not because you skipped it, but because you had the tools to be able to move through it. And I, and I think it's important you talk about the tools. I think it is important for us to have those tools in our toolkit because everyone's different. Everyone's going to process things different. And then from each situation to each situation, you know, even though we're going to process things different. So to have different tools in your toolkit, one of my favorite things to do is I treat those, I like to call them colorful emotions. I don't like to label them positive or negative. I just call them colorful. When those colorful emotions come in, I treat them like someone coming into my house, like ringing the doorbell, coming in, taking your shoes off. Would you like a glass of water? Would you like a snack, right? You know, which chair would you like to sit on? Please, you know, put your feet up, get comfortable. Let's have a conversation. It's one of my favorite things to do for my own self. Um, you know, some of my clients like it, some of some of them don't. But for me personally, that's my favorite tool and technique to use just to have that conversation to say, what are you here for? What are you teaching me? You know, what am I supposed to learn from this? And I love being able to have those difficult and challenging conversations with myself, you know, with those yeah. emotions. There's a, I think there's a challenge and I'm going to blanket as masculine energy. So I don't, I don't think that's fair. When you think about traditional men as they, you know, they don't want to be seen as weak and they see those negative emotions, those color emotions or whatever, you know, how we're going to refer to them. I can't cry. And, you know, one of the, one of the interesting things as we were kind of going through this book is that the, there was a period in my life and, and um, it was the summer of summer of 2009 and, um, and there was an airplane crash in Afghanistan and we were, um, we were standing on the flight line and two, two squadrons an F-15 squadron and an A-10 squadron. And we were doing the memorial for Pitbull and Lag to, uh, Mark McDowell's Pitbull and, um, Lag Grammouth. And I remember this emotion and it's something that I can call back very quickly, very freely. I can get there pretty easily. I remember standing in, in formation. I was standing at attention, so rigid. And I remember this just wave of emotion come through and these, these, these tears being held back and then something blocking it, whether it was, you know, my 
portion of my brain that says, beat that back. It's not professional. You know, you don't deserve that. And I just, I stopped it and, and very quickly came back to work and, you know, started doing the next thing. And, and it took years, you know, to go back and to go, why did you stop that? It's a very appropriate time for you to feel that emotion and to have that outlet and that, you know, to feel those tears come through. And, and I don't think there was any judgment from anyone else. I don't think there was any um, blame or shame associated with it, but it was something that I did for myself. And, and now at a much later point in life is that uh, I, I still don't particularly like crying, but it's, it's not, it's not just the crying. It's that I'm just a really ugly crier, like the real, like deep, can't get my breath and it's just <laughs> ugly. Um, but there is some vulnerability associated with it. But for me, a lot of it's just to get myself into a safe space and to just cry for how, however long, you know, to say I need to be experiencing this emotion and then to find the value in it. And I think that's probably a lot of what you really talk about on this show and, and work with and your clients is you go, what's the learning value of that? And what do you need to discover about yourself so that you can now find value, find gratitude and return to that place of peace with yourself? So, you know, there's just so much in this book. And, and one of the very interesting things that I'll kind of just close this piece with is that it became a brotherhood for each other. And we had a couple of conversations where we agreed not to talk about certain things. And the reason was, is that we weren't fully healed. There were places that we weren't willing to go in the book because I wouldn't be willing to stand on a stage and tell the same story because I don't know that I have yet coped with it enough or healed from it enough that I could share it with you and not you know, dump on you with something that I haven't yet healed from. Yeah. And, and that's absolutely fair. And I think also as we kind of go through our journey to, you know, it's like peeling the onion, you know, and, and each layer has its own level of tears, right. And, and you just kind of yeah. keep peeling and keep peeling and there's still more layers, you know, like they just keep popping up. Like you think, Oh, I'm on the other side of this. And, nope. There's more layers to peel. Yeah. So now that's, that, that's almost a little bit dangerous too, you, you know, and I think part of it is that just when you realize that is that maybe it's, maybe it's just not the time to keep going. You, you know, yeah. there is a need to go, okay, you've done great work, Holly. Uh, you know, you've done great work, Luke, but now maybe you just don't go all the way deep on that one yet. You know, give yourself the time to recover and then to say, I'm going to table this and I'll come back and I'll revisit it when I'm in a, you know, in a place that I'm prepared to go deeper with it. Yeah. And, and I found the downloads always come exactly when they're supposed to come. Yeah. So, so in the book, Luke, you talked about the warrior mindset and I love this because I like to, you know, I, I, I like to refer to my community as grateful warriors, right? We have that gratitude and we have that fortitude and you talked about six traits that are present in a victor that can sharpen them like a knife, self-awareness, confidence, self-efficacy, gratitude, community, and reward. Which one of these mean the most to you and why? Well, for sure, you're going to, you're going to know that the gratitude is definitely a place that I'm going to go because I share Not that, that I was leading or anything. <laughs> it's, you know, I, I think that, um, I think that gratitude is is something that is often overlooked. And you know, gratitude to me, and it's actually it's actually not my answer. Um, but gratitude is is the foundation, and it also is it's something that can be learned through practice. And I, I believe what happens that, you know, and I, and I actually don't believe this. I know it to be true for my own life is that you begin to take for granted the goodness. This still isn't the right answer. This is going to be an honorable mention. This is number two <laughs> is um, the, the gratitude. W one of the reasons why I do this, I write it down every single day, handwritten in my journal, every single day, three things that I'm grateful for. 
And some of them are not super great. You know, I went for a morning run. I had a good workout. It's going to be a sunny uh, day in the spring. And it, it may be a reach for me to find something that I'm super grateful for. And then there's days that I say, you know, I'm super grateful for the health that I've been given, that my two beautiful children are healthy. And, and then not to pass judgment on it, but then on my, on my worst days, on the days where I'm just not showing up, is that I can find something that I can be grateful for. And that shift is chemical. There's, you know, truly there's a, there's a chemical, there's a dopamine hit, the serotonin changes that you're able to release things, things by, by focusing, not to be a positive pusher, but to be grateful for the components of your life and to realize that it's not all bad. So, so gratitude is one of those components, but the real one that I think is the most important is the self-efficacy. And it's a word that I had not even really um, spent a lot of time with and, and had to kind of Google, but self-efficacy refers to your believability. And a lot of people don't really believe that they can change their behavior so that they can produce the positive results in their life and they become the block is because it's not really believable for them. Money is one of the easiest ones to look at. Many people don't believe that they can make money for whatever reason. We have all kinds of money stories that we bring into our own life. Our, our parents said money don't grow on trees. I believe that money comes from hard work. And then we block it because we can't create the self-efficacy, the believability associated with achieving our results. It's easier, the self-efficacy is actually easier to look at in the antithesis, is you look at hypochondriacs. Hypochondriacs actually have such high self-efficacy that they, they can believe something and they can manifest it into their own life. They're, they really didn't have a disease and they brought it on themselves simply with the energy. And, you know, it's, it's a, it's a tough thing to look at, but if it's that possible to become a hypochondriac and to actually attract these things to you, it should also be just as easy to attract healthiness, a well-being, gratitude, excitement, the benefits of life that you would like to achieve. So, so that's the, you know, how do you increase the believability? How do you increase the self-efficacy to make something be more possible that that seems to be one of the true um secrets and it's almost like you, you hear the stories about the doctors telling someone that you know diagnosed with some kind of you know late stage cancer and they've got x number of days to live and in x number of days they're gone i mean it's just that that level of you know yeah but i think what's interesting too breaking down self-efficacy is I think we live in a world of believing that life is 50, 50, you know, and, and from a place of something happens to us and then we have a response, right? It's a stimulus and response and thinking about it, like it's that person's fault or it's that thing's fault or whatever that I'm not getting what I'm supposed to get. But when you remove that external thing from the equation, a hundred percent that's left is you. And, you know, you're the one that's responsible. And that responsibility, I think, is one of the hardest things to do as a human being is to take that level of, I like to call it radical responsibility. But once you cross that line, you're like, it's kind of addictive. A little bit of a little bit of a dopamine yeah, hit. Of the, <laughs> I think one of the, one of the most provoking things that I say in, in one of the seminars that I teach is around that level of personal responsibility. And it gets, it gets very divisive. And I give the example is this, um, if I walk out of the presentation today and I get in my rental car in whatever city I'm in and I pull into traffic and I get T-boned by a drunk driver and I'm killed and my kids now have no father. Whose fault is it? And it's super easy to go, it was the drunk driver's fault. You, you know, should not have been impaired. And, and that's almost the go-to answer for everybody in the room. I go the other way and say, it's my responsibility. 
I made the choice to be in Chicago or, or you know, Washington, D.C. or Minneapolis, wherever I was speaking, I made the decision to be there. I also made the decision for the rental car that I was going to drive. I made the decision to uh, leave at the time that I did. One second left or right, and I might not have been killed by that drunk driver. And, uh, you know, I, I, I would never project this on someone who's going through truly traumatic times. I don't believe that accepting responsibility is something that you demand of others. I don't believe it's something that you project on others. It's a journey that you go through on yourself, on your, on your path to say, what is it that I need to take responsibility for? And the more that you can gain accountability, the more that you can take responsibility is really the more that you can take your power back in any situation to realize that to the de to any degree that you believe that you can be in control of your life, which obviously we're not, is that you believe that you can accept res responsibility and then you can become the cause instead of the effect of your actions. Absolutely. That's I love the way that you crafted that, Luke, in terms of, you know, and especially from the place of you have to go on your own journey to get there. And I think that's almost like everything that we're talking about to really understand not just the responsibility, but even the resilience. Like, you know, I, there's days that I don't want to be strong. You know, I don't want to be resilient. But that resilient builds up over time. And it's when you accept it, when you let it in, when you let it be a part of your journey, that's when it becomes a part of you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, and, I, and I encourage folks, it's, it's okay to have bad days. Yeah. And, you know, one of the challenges, and I talk a lot about my show, is, is really high performance and driving to high performance. But what I don't probably give enough credit to is what happens on the down times and the recovery times. Um, the times that you are, you know, I'll give you this, Holly. There's a couple of sensations that um, I wasn't super um, familiar with anxiety or depression. Those are not two feelings that I really experienced a lot in my life. And the first time that I felt them, I really didn't know what to do with it. So, so depression for me manifests, it, it looks like fatigue, it looks mm. like tiredness, is that I just lose the energy and the desire to get up and do anything. And to the degree that you can just stay there for a moment and go, yeah, well, if your body's tired, then your body should rest and you should allow it the time to recover. And then, like you said, with those color emotions to get curious and go, what is causing that and where do i need to accept responsibility and where can i make changes in my life to be more resilient and for me it's pretty easy it's exercise mm -hmm. and you know may maybe i can't get up and i can't go run a 10k this morning or maybe i don't want to go power through a workout in the gym but i can go walk i can get up and i can put in the, the headphones and i can go walk so depression was an interesting one that i had not been familiar with and then anxiety is another one. And I, and I talk about it a little bit in the book about um, acute and chronic fatigue was something that I had really not experienced in my life as a fighter pilot is I experienced significant acute fatigue. And I don't mean cute, acute as small. I mean, acute as localized. So when I would roll in and point my nose at a target and then come off under G in combat, I'm under a significant level of duress for a small amount of time. It's not small. It's actually quite big. It's just localized. And I got very used to those spikes in stress levels, and they did not create anxiety for me. As a business owner, when I was going through the first, the you know, the foundational years, three, three, four, five years of my business, was that I didn't realize what I was experiencing was actually chronic fatigue, where it was piling up. And I think about it like filling up a cup is that, you, you know, the, the acute, the localized stuff is the little splash that you're putting in there. But the chronic fatigue is what stays in the cup. 
And if the cup is all the way full all the time and you add that acute or localized stress, then you're going to fill, you're going to overfill the cup. And the way that manifests for me, I was sitting in a parking lot at a grocery store the day before Thanksgiving, and I felt like I was having a heart attack. And I called my wife and I said, I think I'm having a heart attack. I was probably 36 or 37 years old or something. And she said, why are you calling me? <laughs> you know, <laughs> Go to the emergency room. And, and I guess with some hubris, I didn't. I actually just drove myself to the urgent care, urgent care clinic. And they said, uh, Mr. Lehman, you're not having a heart attack. That's a panic attack. Your your anxiety is so high that your body is having a response to that. And, and it caused me at that point to make some significant shifts in my life about the way that I manage that long-term stress. So the real, you know, the punchline is as you change, you know, as a listener and your body continues to grow and change is that the more that you can become aware of what's going on and you can get curious about that moment and allow it to be, then you can become more resilient on the backside. So Luke, in the book, you talked about the three steps of creating a habit to build resiliency. So we talked a lot about already, you've shared some some great information and the three steps, state the problem, accept your role and identify the outcome. Can you elaborate more on what that means and how we can do this? When I work with high performers, whether they're my team or they're other CEOs or whatever it is, oftentimes we never actually start by asking the right question. When, when we muddy the waters and we get all confused about what we're trying to solve, we find ourselves flowing down this you know river forever, not knowing where how we got there or where we're going. So by stating the problem, one of the things that I like to do is I like to ask for a level of specificity associated with what, what are we actually trying to solve? What is the actual problem? And there's a specific way that I go about doing it with, with you know, when I'm working with someone else, but I have to self-coach myself with it as well to say, what is it that you're actually upset about? Or what is it that you're actually concerned about? Or what specifically is causing the problem for you? And a lot of times we allow it just to be too big. You know, it's it's too grandiose and you go, yeah, I lost my job. But that's probably not what your actual problem is today. So if we, you know, if we walk the dog on that just a little bit, and I say, uh, okay, is it, are you actually upset that you lost your job? Yes. What specifically are you upset about? Well, I'm not sure that I'm going to be able to pay the bills next week. Okay, that's a more specific thing. Okay, and what about not being able to pay the bills is upsetting you? Well, I believe that my children are going to have to be displaced from their home. Okay, now we're somewhere else a little bit further, a little bit closer to something that we can solve. So I would ask you, how real is it now that your children are going to be displaced from their home? Well, today, not super likely. Okay, good. Then we're actually in a safer place than we thought that we were. We need to solve some problems, but if we can figure out the problem that we're actually solving, then we can get closer to it. The second step is accepting your role in it. When you look at, go back to the example of losing your job, what level of responsibility does someone need to take for saying, I lost my job? A back lot of times- responsibility. <laughs> We spend so much time with blame and shame, which but blame and shame is such an interesting, we can, we can sidebar that if you'd like to, that, that is something that I have spent a lot of time studying, but when we, when we displace our responsibility and we allow it to be someone else as well, that they, they did a, a downsizing, they had a layoff. I didn't get along with my boss. We give so much of our power away to someone else instead of saying, well, I wasn't performing at the level that I needed to. Or over the last 36 months, I hadn't taken on more increased responsibility that my leadership was expecting me to be. Or to simply say from responsibility places to go, I'm going to view this as an opportunity to look for career enhancements or advancements. And then we take our own accountability and own responsibility for it. The final piece is to figure out what you actually want. Okay, well, where do you want to go? If we're actually concerned about putting a roof over the head for our kids, where do you want to go? 
Well, I want to make sure that the kids have a roof over their head. Okay, if I'm solving for that problem, then that's a much easier problem to solve than, I, you know, I need to go find a lifelong career full of happiness and fulfillment and all the things that I would like out of a, you know, out of a career. So one of the most powerful components of that is beginning with the end in mind. That's the C Stephen Covey uh, habit there is to start with the end. And that becomes this magnetic pull. And I, you know, I think about it like a tube and there's, there's an interesting thing about setting your trajectory and setting your direction. If you can tell me where you're going, it's like setting an azimuth and saying, I'm going to generally move in that direction. But what also happens on the other end of it is the outcome becomes a magnet and begins to pull you in that direction. So the more clear that you can be about it and more specific about what you want to achieve, you begin to push towards it and it pulls you towards that. And the, you know, the antithesis of that, the opposite is you go, I don't really care what happens. I just want to get a job. Well, then you'll probably just get a job. It might not be fulfilling. It might not be something that you're passionate about. It might not be the most uh, effective use of your time against your earning potential. But if you can be specific about what you want and you say, I'd like to have a job that allows me to work 36 hours for full-time pay. I'd like to make $120,000 a year to do it. I want to be able to work uh, remotely or hybrid or live in Chicago, Illinois. And then, you, you know, and I want it to be in the field that I want it to be in. I can say it with some level of specificity. Now you begin to move in a very specific direction. So that process of figuring out what you're actually solving for and then what you actually want out of it is a very healthy process to move towards a more resilient life. And I love the actual, the, the, the tactical aspects of this, you know, I mean, we can talk about resilience all day long. We could talk about the mindset all day long, but to actually have a tactical game plan, I'm all about the action, right? So to have a tactical game plan to get us from, from A to Z is, is perfect. Thank you for that, Luke. I have two more questions for you, but before we get to the final questions, I want to make sure that you've given us so much great information. And I know that my listeners are going to want to connect with you. First of all, we have your book called Building Resilience, and I will have uh, the link in the show notes for that. So everyone can purchase that. And again, it's just, it's a great, quick, easy, motivational read. Um, your shift work podcast, which is excellent. I've binged quite a few episodes and I'll make sure that I have the link to that. And you, you also provide some great information on Instagram, always just inspiring and motivational thoughts and, and, and quotes and things to think about every single day. How can people work with you? How can people find you? How can people reach out to you and, and connect with you? LukeLayman.com is the easy starting point for it. You know, everything kind of originates there. Um, and I, I really, I think the most important thing is I enjoy hearing from the listeners. Um, it's inspiring to me to hear the journeys that they're on. It's inspiring to me to hear when something has had a positive effect on their life. So I welcome it. Keep it coming. It's just so encouraging to be able to hear um, your journey. Yeah. So thank you for that. So two final questions. The first one is what was it like to be this vulnerable, to put all of this out there with your story and to share this, not just with your book, but then also um, a lot of additional parts of your journey on your podcast. I, I made a decision a few years ago, Holly, to, to live a much more public life. And, and it has some costs for sure. You know, um, one of the things that I'm very cognizant of is, is the unwillingness of others to participate in it. So my children, you, you know, my children aren't asking to, to, to participate in it. Uh, some of the things that I discuss might have an impact on some other people. So I try to be very specific about being my own journey, it, you know, and, and it's not for everyone. Um, I am on a very specific path. Uh, not everybody wants to grow an eight figure business. Not everybody wants to have 60, 70, 80, hundred employees. If you do, then 
then I might be a good person for you to connect with and to follow along on that path. But the vulnerability, you know, I think piece of it is all too often what happens is that people think that the struggles that they're going through are only their struggles and that it's unique to them and nobody else is feeling it. So if my voice can be just one to go, Hey, listen, I'm I, not only, not only was this past tense and I have felt that way before, but I continue to go through it and I continue to find these, these markers and these milestones. And, you know, as an entrepreneur, we go through these cycles of the, will it work? Will it last? Will it work? Will it last? And it happens at six figures. It happens at seven figures. It happens at eight figures. I've never led a nine figure company, but I can only imagine that it will continue as we get into the nine figures. So, you know, you've got good company there, but I think, you know, the vulnerability component of it is that um, it, it makes it real and it's sometimes hard to share some of those components, but it makes it a more real and a more authentic journey. And what I would really encourage, you know, my, mine is a much more public life, but as a leader, you don't have to have a podcast. You don't have to have an Instagram channel you can share with your people the things that matter to you and you can help connect with them in a more authentic capacity. But the last piece that I would tell you about it, you know, going through the book is that I'll foreshadow just a little bit. I'm working on another book right now. And one of the things that really is the, the root of it is the belief systems that we have and the stories that we tell ourselves. And to be able to take a critical analysis at the story, and, and pretty much everything that I wrote in this book was a story. But one of the things that I wrote about specifically was about my parents' divorce. And it's forced me to have a couple of truly authentic discussions with my parents about where they were at their time, and where they are now and how they look at it. But the, the piece that's been so um, challenging is probably the right word. The piece that's been so um, um, freeing, I guess, is to be able to make the stories be more true, to articulate it just a little bit more, to explore a little bit of the emotion surrounding it and to figure out what pieces I might have been missing or where my belief systems led me to a conclusion that might not have been the most broad conclusion. And then final question, Luke, is this past year, you've put out a great podcast, the Shift Work Podcast. You've had a lot of great episodes and share a lot of about your, your life and being very vulnerable. And then also with this book, and now you've got a new book coming out as well. What is the number one thing that you've learned about yourself? That I don't, I don't know that much. That there's a lot more left to learn. Yeah. I, I think that um, the level of curiosity and the expansiveness, and you know, I get this I get this question a lot about the podcast. A lot of the podcast is just my own reflections into the way that I view view the world, and to say, you know, how do you make that be more complete? And I don't, I don't listen to the episodes often, you know, I've got a pretty good idea of what's in my head, but every now and again, I go back and I'm like, damn, Luke, that was, uh, that was pretty good. And he, you know, maybe you should apply that in your own life now again, and you need needing that reminder. But I think that's really been the biggest part of this journey is that the more, you know, the more thirst you have and the more hunger that you have in a, in a deeper desire for learning. And that's, that's been the most encouraging part of it. Well, thank you so much for all of your great information and for being on the gratitude builds fortitude podcast, and I really encourage everyone to reach out to you. So thank you again, Luke, for, for being here and for sharing all of your expertise with us. Thanks Holly. I appreciate it. <music> 